All things, beloved. But not some things. Not just your health when you're feeling like you're 21 years old again. But even if your body is ailing and you've gotten the diagnosis, all things, not just your soul when there are no temptations or trials, but even when your heart is failing and your, your mind is afflicted and confused, all things, not just your marriages, not on those days when there's no strife, but even during those very difficult days and nights, all things includes your present station in life, including today, including all your tomorrows. They may not be good. They may not feel good, but God. And so what do you do, Christian, in the sufferings of the present time? You go to God. Hello, Bezel T3. That was Pastor Jason Pedersen, the Associate Pastor of Valley Presbyterian Church in North Hills, California, preaching on Romans 8, 18 through 32. Now, last week I said I was going to present a God-centered, Christ-exalting sermon and also give you a quick update on our friend Joshua, who underwent brain surgery back in the end of January. So let's get to the sermon first. Well, beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, please turn with me in the Word of God to Romans chapter 8. Now, let's not let that go unnoticed. He begins by addressing the congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Jason is beginning this sermon by addressing the very people of God. Those who are present, but who are not Christians, they are invited guests listening to someone speak a language that they are not familiar with. This year I've been leading a Bible study through the book of Romans on, on Wednesday evenings, and this just seemed like a beautiful and, and, and such a fitting a passage from the Word of God for our church at this season. Now the language that Jason is speaking is the words of God. And that word is only understood by those whom God the Holy Spirit illuminates in their minds and in their hearts. Now I'm going to present only about a quarter of this sermon in the hope that you will go to the link I've provided in the info section and watch and listen to the entire sermon. It will be well worth your time. For those of you willing to do that, it would be great if you would come back to this video and give us your comments. So consider doing that as well. The thing about our passage this morning, and it comes smack dab in the middle of, of these, these two great and glorious high notes in scripture. This passage about suffering, about God's purposes in it, that comes right in between really this Mount Everest of Romans 8, 1. There's no condemnation. For you who believe in Christ Jesus, none. And if that's not enough, Paul, Paul ends the chapter with the reality that nothing, nothing ever, nothing in all creation, yourself included, will ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And it's a good thing he says those things. Because right in between him we have uh, these two glorious mountain peaks, we have a lot of suffering. There's a lot of grittiness that we, we face in this life as we await the glory to come. And, and what I want us to see this morning is that there's glory even now in the midst of your sufferings. Don't miss that. I, want, I don't want you to miss the love of God and the glory of God and the ultimate purpose of God and what you're going through. Evil and suffering are real, beloved. Corruption is real. Paul is going to make that known. But, but they're part, they're only part of a bigger picture. You know, one of the things I appreciate most about the Bible is how real it is. Paul is not telling you here to transcend your sufferings. The word of God is not telling you here to ignore your sufferings. Paul is not saying to you, oh, your sufferings are not really all that bad. Think about it. Think uh, about to whom he's writing. He's writing to the Romans. They were going through it. You know who was emperor? Nero. Rome is Babylon. You know what emperors required? Worship as God, as a deity. No problem, unless you're a Christian. And you know what's the first thing he does there in verse 19? It's a rather strange way. He personifies creation. Notice the glory of God and the groaning of creation. Creation's waiting, look at, with, with eager longing 
Eager longing for what? For the revealing of the sons of God. We should be longing for the glory to come, but even when we don't as we ought, what's creation doing? It's longing for our glorification. Why? Creation's personified here, uh, that word eager longing or anxious longing. It's giving us a picture of someone watching with, a, with an outstretched neck, with a head lifted up. It's almost like creation standing on its tiptoes, eyes looking ahead expectantly. Paul's making the point that when Christ returns, <laughs> we are glorified, body and soul. New heavens and new earth are ushered in. Creation doesn't know that, does it? But that's the picture Paul's painting, and we have to understand why here. Why is creation waiting this? Because look at verse 20. It's been subjected to futility. Look at the language Paul uses there. Creation is in bondage to corruption. Creation has been groaning for some time now in the pains of childbirth. Creation is like an expectant mother in the anguish of labor pains. Tsunamis, famine, pestilence, raging forest fires, birth defects, even death itself. Human death was not part of the natural order of creation before the fall into sin. The, the, the rending of, of the soul from the body, very unnatural. And these various natural disasters that bring about death are just as unnatural. They are the groanings of creation. It's futility, it's, it's corruption on display for all to see. Of course, creation initially was supposed to work in harmony with humanity. <laughs> now at times it causes great devastation to those of us who inhabit the earth. And that still begs the question, doesn't it? Why do these things happen in the first place? Well, Paul tells us in verse 20, creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. We can tend to read past that. Part of what's going on with this life-death cycle, with these cataclysmic disasters, God is showing us a horrible parable of the outrage of moral evil and sin against him. And so instead of calling God into question, oh, how could God allow such things? We must see these things serve as trumpet blasts. These things are wake-up calls. These things are warnings to those who experience, who survive these events. They're warnings to turn somewhere else, to someone else. But you notice we're groaning as well. Notice the glory of God and the groaning of the Christian. Paul says not only the creation, but we ourselves groan inwardly. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly await for adoption as sons. The redemption of our bodies. You notice Paul ties in with us waiting with the redemption of our bodies. In other words, there's a degree of frailty, isn't there? Well, there's frailty to our present condition. We, we fumble along at times. Life hits us upside the head. Gives us a kick in the seat of the pants. We all carry around with us these bodies that fail to work as well as we would like. Who of you hasn't dealt with some sort of physical infirmity? Some would teach you, you just need a second blessing of the Holy Spirit. Everything will be all right. I don't think so. You groan. Inwardly, probably even more, the more you get acquainted with God, the more you hope in Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory, the more you know him, are acquainted with him, the more you probably inwardly groan. Remember our Savior after all, when Lazarus dies, show me where you've laid him. He goes, and what does he do? We remember him weeping, but he, he, he groans outwardly. That's why we must see that the groaning of creation, your groaning, dear Christian, the groaning of the Holy Spirit with ineffable words are all serving a particular purpose. They're all working towards a particular end. And that is your glorification. The glory of God in your glorification. Look at verses 28 and following. Paul says that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. 
What is the will of God in your sufferings? People make these verses so much more confusing than they need to be. These are some of the most straightforward verses in the Bible. Paul is not saying all things you experience are good. He's not saying that. There are a lot of non-good, sinful things that, that we are on the giving or receiving end of in this life. Sin is not good. Sin is bad. But God actually works all, in all, thi- all things for good. Ultimate good. That good that all things are working towards is your or ultimate Christ-likeness. I like to think of it this way. The greatest good in all existence is God. Who? Who he is. What he does. That's the greatest good. The second greatest good. Do you know what it is? It's your conformity into the image of Christ. And you know what, beloved? Even if you don't go to him as you ought, he has come for you. He has come for you. He who did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely give you all things? He didn't spare his son. You don't go to him as you ought. You sin against him. You suffer. He comes to you. He came to you in Christ. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, nowhere to lay his head, suffered ridicule, was despised and rejected by men on account of your sin. The bread shows forth the love of God in giving the Son his body, which was pierced for your transgressions, crushed for your iniquities. Upon Christ was the punishment that brought you peace. He suffered for you. The cup shows forth that blood, that blood of the new covenant poured out for the sins of many, for the ways you distrust, Romans 8, 28, for the ways we grumble and gnash our teeth against God. He died for those sins that you might enter and suffering and glory was the pattern of your Savior's life. It is the pattern of our lives. And God would remind you of that at this table. He's given you a son. He holds nothing back for your spiritual good. He graciously gives you all things. And so as you see these elements, as you hold them in your hands, know your grip is weak and failing. God will never let you go from his hands because he loves you. Receive these elements as you take them to your lips as the father's kiss to you, his child. The table is spread, and you know what it points to? That marriage supper of the Lamb. (laughs) The glory that is to come that awaits all of you who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. This table is for God's children, those who've been baptized, those who are trusting in Christ. The table is ready. If you have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're in unrepentant sin, let the elements pass. But this is a table for sinners, weak sinners, suffering sinners who have a strong Savior. Come commune with him here for eternal life. Well, there you have it. No props, no dark blue background with multicolored spotlights beaming upwards towards the crowd. No altar call with background music intended to pull on the heartstrings. Only a pastor a passage and complete confidence in the sufficiency of God's word through the power of the Holy Spirit to do his work, to convict and encourage, to condemn through the law and to make free by the gospel, to create faith in some and to build it up in others, the preaching of God's word, and in this case, a seamless transition to the Lord's Supper, are God's revealed means of grace in which he nourishes the believer and draws those that he has intended to save from the foundation of the world. Take the time and hear this sermon in its entirety. Your soul will be strengthened and encouraged for whatever may come your way. Okay, now for a quick update on our friend Joshua. Right after I visited the Bible allegedly leaking oil that was in my area back in the end of January, um, I, I received an email from a guy named Joshua asking for prayer. 
Remember, I believe in miracles, the miracles we find in scripture and the fact that God still does miracles today, although they are rare. Uh, a lot of times God uses just normal means uh, to, to accomplish his will. Now, I was contacted by a, a new subscriber who wrote me through my Gmail account and he says this, he says, my name is Joshua. I have had one previous brain surgery to repair an AVM that was leaking and caused a stroke in 2005. I was 22 years old at the time. I've struggled with epilepsy from that time on. So they're hoping that with this first surgery, they can perform some tests and figure out what part of the brain the epileptic activity is originating. And hopefully they can remove that part without any further paralysis or weakness on my left side. So he was asking me if I would pray for him and I, I have been praying for him. Now I think I mentioned somewhere along the line that he did have the surgery in late January, but now I wanna give the latest update from him for those of you who have been praying for him. He writes this, he says, I'm doing fairly well. I'm still having occasional seizures, but the severity of the seizures is much better than before. Instead of losing consciousness and going into full convulsions, I'm now just having small tremors in my left arm and drawing of my left hand. But praise God, the surgeries seem to have, although not eliminated the seizures completely, greatly reduced the severity of the seizures, and I have some cool new scars. <laughs> well, I thank God for Joshua's willingness to be cared for by Christians he does not yet know. I mean, we're all going to know each other one day. And it reminds me of Romans 12, 9 through 14. Listen to this. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. You see, as Christians, we need to be about doing these things as well as allowing other Christians to do them for us when we are in need. May Joshua, you and I, better understand what God is saying to us through his word and spirit.